I would like to start with you. Um, you are the director of Real, a cultural institute and architectural practice. You're the editor in chief of Real Review and co founder of Real Homes. In 2016, you created the British Pavilion at the Venice Architectural Biennale uh, with the show Home Economics. And you are the author of various works, including Real Estate's Life Without Debt and Home Economics, New Models of Domestic Life. And so, though you are a writer and a journalist, I want to invoke your architectural spirit, since we don't often talk about architecture at Evenings for the North at the library. And in the first issue of your magazine, Real Review, so this is in the summer of 2016, imagine it was a busy year that year, <laughs> in an article called Why You Should Think About Architecture, you write that most people in the world do not consider architecture very deeply, if at all. We do not think you go on, could this have been done in a better way? Does this space make me more or less free as an individual? Does it represent our values as a civilization? Who made this place? Why and for whom? And you kind of argue at the end of that paragraph. But in fact, we should be looking for clues about social power in even our very home, our own homes. And so my first question is, why should we think about architecture? And can you and please, will you make a case for considering architecture as a way into understanding the structure of society itself. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent question. Also, first time I've ever had a second person biographical introduction, which made me feel like this was kind of a show about my life, which I was rather enjoyed. Thank you. Um, uh, to answer your question, I guess there's a couple of things to say. The first is that. I use the term architecture quite broadly, but um, a lot of people will not recognize a lot of the work that I do as architecture. I, I think I can say that there's some overlap with my practice with Molly in that sense as well, um, which is often the case if you're, uh, in Molly's case, um, experimental and radical in pushing the boundaries of what architecture can be. And in my case, not wholly interested in the, the fundamental labor conditions of architecture. Um, uh, so in that sense, I want to be kind of clear that, you know, what I think architecture is. I mean, architecture is, uh, people will tell you, uh, and this was an argument uh, of uh, Mark Cousins, who was um, an architectural historian who passed away recently. Uh, many people will tell you that architecture begins in ancient Greece or ancient Rome, or they'll pick some arbitrary, it's the pyramids or whatever. They'll choose some, ancient moment um sorry I, I hope you can't hear the horn outside um but in, in actual fact um you can't really have architecture without the architect and the architect is a, an invention really of the 19th century or if we go back a little bit further we might argue the late 15th century in in italy it's a highly specific concept it doesn't cut across different uh, global context and it really refers to a specific type of um, person who's charged with uh, imagining and designing and then executing the project of a building in service of a particular power and authority um, and so from its its origin I mean this is why architects uh, you know always have clients and mostly their clients are either the state or rich people that's the kind of concept of architecture there are very brief periods in history where that's not the case. Um, so I use architecture advisedly, uh, but actually what I'm really interested in is what I would call politics of space. And I think that text that you're referring to was, um, had come out of work that I had been doing at that time, uh, research into the origins of home economics. Um, in the 19th century uh, in America, there were a group of, suffragettes who wanted women to have the vote they wanted women to have greater political agency in society and more economic freedom and they were looking for a way or what they realized is that you couldn't have um economic uh, freedom or political agency unless women were better educated because uh, certainly outside of the major american cities the, the, the majority of women in agricultural areas were illiterate. Uh, so then there was this question of how do we smuggle in education under the banner of uh, a, a patriarchy? And since most 
men who finished uh, primary school didn't go to high school, they went to agricultural college to become better farmers. The argument was that you could invent what they called domestic science, which would teach uh, women um, basic numeracy, basic science, mathematics, uh, about how to apply for a mortgage or manage a household budget and so on, um, uh, chemistry. And, and, and this became eventually home economics, which if any of you have, I don't believe it was taught in the US uh, very recently, but in the, in the UK until the late last century, home ec was a kind of default course in, in high school. And that's what explains it, why it's such an unusual course that teaches you like how to rewire a kettle, how to iron a shirt, how to make a cake, and also like how to decorate an interior. I mean, a very strange confluence of activities in home ec. And that's why it's basically a, a kind of um, crash course education to raise the political agency of women. But these same women who were creating uh, domestic science began to give a great amount of attention to the functional layout of, of homes. Um, sorry, I'll, be, I'll come to the point very quickly. I realize I'm turning this into a mini lecture, but the conclusion is that they uh, were what we would now call uh, feminist materialists. And they believed that the basic design of certain objects could have a very big impact on social power relations within the home. So for example, they made within their handbooks of domestic science, also proposals of floor plans, which did things like uh, put the shortest distance between the head of the dining table and the armchair next to the fire as passing through the kitchen and the laundry, whereas previously it might have gone down the hallway. This was to make visible the domestic labor of their wives and so on. Um, but, I, you know, I've always argued that my parents divorced because we had a circular dining table. Um, my mom, who is a, an Australian uh, uh, with working class background, quite strong feminist attitude, and my dad, who's just a classic middle class white English guy, you know, my dad was always looking for the literal and metaphorical head of the table. Uh, so I think he assumed that the dining table would always be rectangular, whereas, uh, you know, my mom assumed that we would all sit equal with each other uh, around a circular table. And I think in that sense, my father never managed to find his literal and metaphorical place within the family because the order and hierarchy was upended by this circular table. So I, at that time, I believed very strongly that quite minor changes in objects and their relationship to each other could have very big effects on the structure of the family and the structure of our relationship with each other. Anyway, sorry for such a long answer. Mm -hmm. I'll keep it brief from here on. Well, I mean, all of that is to say, well, let's, we'll come, we'll, we'll get back to this. I think all of that is to say, right, that the des design is just in the way that kind of feminists would take, say later in, in the same century, you know, the personal was political. You know, the kind your your argument really is that the 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 space is political, the design itself is political. Molly, I want to get to you, um, and I'll introduce you the same way I introduced Jack, which is actually I have something I've learned from French classmates. Um, you're the co-founder and CEO of Automated Architecture Limited, co-director of A. UAR Labs at the Bartlett School of Architecture at UCL, where you're also an associate professor in architecture and you're a co-author of Robotic Building Architecture and the Age of Automation. And in your work in Automated Architecture Limited, much like Jack, you're thinking about architecture as a way to not only design and build homes, but to empower people and communities to live better and more sustainable lives by tackling specifically the housing deficit, which is to say that in the next 80 years, there's a need for 2 billion new homes. Um, can you describe the project of Automated Architecture Limited and how concretely you hope to engage with this enormous housing deficit? Sure, I mean, um, so I guess one of the first things to outline is that we have both a research lab and a company. And so the research lab um, often is a place where we can begin to, to be a bit more speculative about how we might have conversations with communities, in communities, across communities, both within architecture, but also within the adjacent disciplines and also with people um, that aren't within academia. So that has been a place for us to really um, open up those conversations. And the company now is really a place where we kind of apply a lot of those conversations in the real world with real clients and, and, um, and real projects. So they have a kind of distinct identity the two, those two kind of zones and two hats that we have, and they're also um, intimately intertwined. So um, 
uh, maybe one of the examples that I could give is that one of the projects we did in, in 2020, which actually started a couple of weeks before the UK lockdown, was a project um, based in the southwest of the UK in a place called um, Knoll West in Bristol, which is a 1930s council estate, um, radial layout of um, a, a, just on the southwest um, or south part of Bristol. And um, it's a community that has a high number of tradespeople. It has, um, it's also one of the top five, five percent um, deprived areas of the country. And so we were really trying to think about um, how we could deal with the targets that Bristol City has around housing within that community. And what's really interesting about Knoll West is that it has, it's really, you know, it's classic kind of 1930s housing state. So it's low rise, low density, um, you know, a lot of emphasis on the car and, auto and driving and really poor infrastructure, really difficult place to navigate. And it's become this kind of fringe town. But as a result, it also has um, a lot of space. <laughs> and so one of the things that we've been trying to do in Knoll West is really think about how can we address issues such as um, consequences of the climate crisis in that community by densifying that community. And one of the ways that we're doing that is thinking about how can we use some of the tool newest tools and technologies to begin to engage with those con those with that community in new kinds of conversations about housing because the way that we design and build housing today is almost nonsensical. We can't deal with the deficit in the way that things are happening right now and the status quo um, for the way that we build. In fact, we're only creating more inequity and more striation and, and more like long-term issues um, with the way that we build today. So we're trying to really look at it in a, in a way as a form of activism in a form of grassroots kind of practice, but we're using tools and technologies that allow us to think more unilaterally across across um, different kinds of contexts. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that we do that is by um, using what, like, an arts-based approach, which is really thinking about um, what are the assets in that community already? And the assumption that we make is that 80% of what's needed is already there. It's just that we have to uncover what's missing. Mm -hmm. And what's missing in that community has to come from the community itself. So in Brock West, one of the things that we did was really think about, okay, so what is missing in this community at this time? Um, and you know, came up with ways of working within the community that allowed us to, with, with some of the new tools and technologies that we have, which is like using some um, design apps that we've developed, as well as some of the, some of the more automated technologies that we have. Um, we work with industrial robots, for example, VR and AR to really engage them in thinking about some of these questions about what's missing. Mm -hmm. um, and we build. So a lot of the things that we do is really hands-on. So we built a housing prototype in Knoll West. We magically did it in that little gap before wave one and in between wave one and wave two of COVID, right. where we miraculously came together and celebrated. And I think what's really interesting about, about that is that it gave us a prototype for thinking about how to make these questions tangible to people. Mm -hmm. And if you can make those questions tangible to people, you can give people the power to ask the right kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. And if they have the power to ask the right kind of questions, it means that they can actually have conversations across communities and they can have conversations or begin to have conversations with people that are in power in new and in, in new and provocative ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that gives us a lot of, um, it gives us a lot of strength within the community because it means that people are discovering new things but also discovering actually their inherent power as citizens and how they can begin to, to demand more from the people that have, you know, a lot of the power right now. Mm. I have two follow-up questions, and then we get back to Jack. What is nonsensical about the way that we build today? Well, many things. So, um, in housing, in particular, the housing sector really can't meet the de meet the demand for housing. We know in the UK, you know, in, in the council that I'm in, there's fourteen thousand people on a housing wait list. the 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 um, The state isn't building new housing. Um, so we have a huge gap between who can get housing and who has access to housing um, and what kind of housing is being built. The way that we design and build is also incredibly fragmented. So it creates this really long and striated production chain for housing where there's a lot of different players that have to come together, somehow miraculously come together in order for one house to get built. It's also highly carbon intensive. So um, the built environment alone is 39% of all carbon emissions. So if we think about how we can shorten that production chain and localize production of housing 
in really real and tangible ways, we can address all these kinds of issues. There's also the issue of land in the UK. There's a huge problem in terms of land speculation. House builders aren't building because they're trying to make as much money off of speculating on that land. Um, and there's a lot, there's only 10 house builders, major house builders in the country building the vast majority of homes. So uh, again, it's kind of this financialization, both of the production process, but also of, of the home itself that we have, um, have serious problems with. My second question is about the we who's who's building and I think we're going to get back to that later because we want to I want to talk about at what point uh, does your work end and at what point does the work of the robots begin. <laughs> um, but Jack, I want to go back to you because you're also thinking and writing about the acute housing shortage in Britain and uh, you're also addressing and I'm taking this from your from your book um, home economics wage stagnation personal debt precarious living and working conditions gender inequality you mentioned previously and the impact uh, long-term impact of austerity measures um, and so this book from 2016 based on your show um, and ultimately kind of in the introduction you write that we are in a crisis of how to live which is which is a big statement to make and to this crisis you offer five architectural solutions and crucially you argue that instead of thinking about solutions through the traditional lens of space like many of your colleagues i imagine we should be thinking about um, them through the lens of time and so you kind of demark eight time as hours days months years and decades and so my question is why should we think about architecture through precisely this lens of time mm -hmm. and what briefly does space in hours days months years and decades look like mm. um i'll work backwards and say that uh in i'm just gonna say in in western design uh uh history i'm not gonna give that too much of a definition but in the West, space is normally preferenced over time as a form of design. So if you go back to the Renaissance, all of those one point perspectives exist as spatial drawings, but they don't depict any time. Um, this is very different from, for example, the history of Chinese scroll drawing, which is a depiction of time. It's not a, it, the space is wrapped up in its unfolding. Um, uh, so it, it, we tend to think of the way that housing gets built in terms of spatial solutions at kind of freeze frames in people's lives. Uh, for example, we tend to design um, housing around particular demographic categories. So it's like student housing, first time homes, retirement homes, uh, you know, worker housing and so on. Um, and at least in London, a good way of understanding this is uh, you know, we have massive under occupancy in older people. Uh, so we have people who bought their houses in the 1960s and 70s, where they have a five bedroom house where there might only be one or two people living in it. And then we have massive over occupancy amongst young people, where you'll have even the living room. And I knew this as well when I lived in Paris, it was the same uh, in the late, uh, in the 2010s. Um, that often even the living room will be converted into a bedroom uh, so there's no more a public space inside the apartments and so a traditional like spatial logic is to say oh well, that's fine we just need to kick out all the old people and get them to go and live in you know retirement homes into this category and then we can use these houses to be filled up with other people whereas i think if we take the idea that a home has to uh, adapt to the needs of the person throughout their time throughout their entire life the question is how do you design a home which is appropriate for an 18 year old and for an 80 year old and what are the structures that might be in place around that so it's true that home economics was the first exhibition of architecture to look at occupation uh, of the home as the driving factor on design and it basically just said a home for decades the amount the way in which you invest in a home that you will live in for decades not just financially but also emotionally is really different from a home that you might only spend a few months in for example while you're a student while you're a worker doing uh, working in a foreign country and so on so that that was the, the essence of that in terms of i'll just say something very briefly about the, the importance of time in architecture itself um, and this is, again, I'm moving, I mean, housing is not strictly architecture in the sense that the vast majority of uh, homes are not, as, as Molly was saying, that they're, they're not designed by architects, there are no architects involved in them. Um, but I, I, I want to say this, which is that in, in the UK, 
95.96% of all buildings are built to sell. And what that means is that the developer who makes it is only interested in how to make that building cheaper and faster, um, because that's the metrics that, that really matter for that developer. Um, but when we're talking about housing in the context of climate crisis, actually it's less important how cheap the building is to build. It's more important how cheap the building is to run and what happens to the building throughout its entire material life cycle, not just how much carbon it produces to produce, to, to make the building, but how much it consumes, what types of resources it consumes, uh, what its uh, toxic or other effects on, on its uh, environment might be throughout its lifetime, and then how we disassemble it. Because it, it's also the case that 65% of all landfill globally is building waste, either from the construction process or from demolition. So basically we have you know, a, a linear uh, economy uh, there. And the reason why we don't really see it is because the developers do not care if your home costs a thousand euros to run a month or 200 euros to run a month They're, because there's no incentive for them to consider the occupation of the home at all. Uh, and so in terms of the, the work that I'm doing, I think Molly and I overlap a lot. Um, and it was interesting when she was talking about, let's say finding the thing which is missing or identifying the thing which is missing. Um, one of the ways that I, I know Molly is because of our uh, shared, uh, um, I guess, passion for avoiding human extinction um, and, uh, and other uh, forms of extinction. Um, and uh, so this idea of kind of restorative, um, but also circular uh, thinking, I think, is very um, important in that process. And, and time is really central to that. And, and if I can conclude on that point, you know, the 20th century, really, the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, the, the latter part of, of modernity. Um, this has been defined by um, linear processes, so cumulative and exhaustive processes of extraction and profit and generation. And um, uh, it's, imp I mean, it's, it's impossible. When, when I hear people say like, oh, communism doesn't work, I always think, yeah, but they managed to structure a totalitarian regime around it for like more than a century in Russia, right? Uh, and then I think about capitalism. It's like, well, capitalism doesn't work either. Everyone's miserable the whole time. You can never achieve the outcome of capitalism, which is a high paying, easy and fulfilling job, which allows you to consume as many products as you like, which will bring you infinite happiness. I mean, that's not possible. Um, and it's based on infinite profit on a finite planet which is just like a contradiction that's so profound. So in this sense, it's kind of like, yeah, capitalism also doesn't work. Um, and yet we're still able to construct societies around these kind of impossible dreams. Um, but anyway, yeah, basically that's, that's why time is really <clears throat> important to consider in the built environment. Um, and that's also why it's important to think about design beyond yourself, beyond one client, um, to think about, uh, you know, how, how could you, it, it, I, I sometimes think about what it might have been like to um, go for dinner at a friend's place when uh, London was a Roman city or equally in Paris. Um, what the feeling of that might have been like to walk through the streets uh, or equally during the reign of uh, Louis XV, for example. I mean, and, and in that sense, whatever you design today, you have to imagine that it might be occupied by people who are as different from you as we are from them. Um, anyway, yeah. no, that's great. great. Um, and I, I want to depart, um, you know, we're talking about time, uh, which of course is central, uh, or the lack of it is central to the climate crisis that you've both mentioned, of course, that we're both facing uh, among other crises, um, especially today on continental Europe. Um, <laughs> but departing from a quote uh, and even a call to action um, from the end of Jack's introduction at Home Economics, Molly, I wanted uh, to read it and then ask you kind of about it because I think you're really embodying it in your work. So the quote is, and it was kind of reused by other people writing in the book, life is changing and we must design for it. And you could say, you know, the environment is changing, we must design for it. Our relationship, the environment is changing, we must design for it. In other words, um, yeah, we must design for the change. And so clearly in your work, you're embracing the ever-changing nature of life and designing for it. And like with all change, um, 
some people of course are not ready to accept it let alone design for it and in your essay from 2019 becoming digital you write that despite rapid digi digitization in almost all other industries construction remains one of the least affected uh, i'm curious about this and since you are at the vanguard <laughs> of architecture in the age of automation have you confronted challenges uh, from the more let's say traditional architects within the field who aren't ready to see the discipline to robots making obsolete human nature and what is the nature of your um uh, critics discontent <laughs> <laughs> sure um so one of the things that we use as a line a lot to really um yeah, just a, as a kind of opening line in an elevator pitch is like the, one of the largest industries in the world has no robots. Construction, the construction industry is incredibly manually, manually done, right? It's incredibly reliant on manual labor. Um, and it's the second least digitized industry in the world. So this is a really interesting problem when you put it against um, the house housing deficit, the climate crisis, um, the amount of digitization in other industries since the middle of the 20th century, the kind of vast amount of um, use of digital technologies when we look at almost every as other aspect of daily life um, or of production of daily life, you know, in terms of um, how factories are run that make your iPhone or whatever. Um, so it's really interesting problem when you place it in relationship to these other contexts and these other issues. And so one of the things that we um, come up against is that um, people think that what we're out to do is have robots take those jobs. And we're not really interested in that question. That's not really the problem. The problem is that we have it in, we have that um, lack of automation and construction in relationship to a, a huge need to change the industry in order to supply a very basic human right, which is shelter. And currently we can't do that. Currently we, we can't house people adequately um, in the way that we do things. So we need to think of new ways of doing that. And one of the things that we um, come up against is that people will see, see robots like um, uh, construction robotics spot, which is a dog robot that's being used to do surveying and other things. Um, potentially in, in high disaster areas, we really need to send in a robot in order to, to not risk human life. Um, and you, they see that and it's terrifying to them. So we're trying to think, what are ways that we can de-risk and introduce automation that don't create this kind of fear mongering, but also don't create this kind of fetishization of what a robot is. You know, the robot that we're talking about is not like Rachel and Blade Runner. It's a robot that is actually incredibly dumb and simple and can do things that we don't want to do and can do things more effectively that we don't want to do as people and actually opens up space for us to be more creative and opens up more space for us to think radically about how we might want to live together or how we might want to produce together. So that's one of the things that we try and do is really think about how can we, you know, yeah, how can we kind of use that, the simplicity of the kind of robot that we have to really open up those questions. Another thing is that we come across is that um, the, the building system that we've developed in our um, company is very much um, rethinking architecture um, as an architecture that is not really, in a building system that's not really for human production, it's for automation. So we're thinking about how we can, again, sort of bridge that gap between a really manual way of, of producing architecture and an automated way of producing architecture. And the building system kind of tries to talk to both of those ends of the spectrum. So the building system, for example, is um, we use one building element for every part of a building. So previously, if you'd have columns and floor slabs and beams, whatever, um, and they'd all be different types. Instead, we're saying, okay, let's go back to basics and really think about what is an, what is a, an architecture for automation that can also begin to rethink some of these spatial typologies in the way that we live, the way that we build. And so we have one block that does everything, one building element that does everything. And that building element can be produced um, using automation really, really simply and really quickly. But it's also very repetitive. It's not something that a lot of people will want to do. So it also opens up space for us thinking about how traditional craftspeople might begin to engage with it or interact with it 
and create new kinds of ways of working together with automation. So we're trying to like demystify some of those that pra that those practices um, and these conversations about how automation begins to intersect with more traditional modes of production. Um, recently, we were in um, we were were selected as part of the Global Investment Summit, which was the UK government's largest event coming up to COP26, which um, uh, my partner Jill Retson was. Um, was introduced to Prince Charles and uh, we were the only people there that had a, a robot. We were one of 12 companies selected as kind of the innovators in green technology that the government wanted to hoist on us on a, on a, a silver platter, which was really interesting and strange experience to have. And Prince Charles said, oh, these robots, they're terrifying to me. And can you, only, and, and then the other question that we get is because often our building system currently is being used for um, uh, it's very, in a way, people identify it as being very modernist because oftentimes there's, there we have flat roofs. People say, well, it doesn't look like a house. It, can you do a pitched roof? So that's the other question that we have is like, can we make the, use automation to produce more of the same or are we using it to really think radically about how we might shift the way that we build and the way that we design and what we build and what we design and how we do it. Um, so yeah, we have these kind of multiple modes of kind of addressing that issue um, around how, around uh, around the fear around automation, let's say. Well, and why, can, can I ask you, why do you think there is such a fear around automation, given the fact that our society is so structured now around the digital? I mean, it was before COVID, right? We had our phone, you know, people talk about our phones as kind of like the, the organ of the 21st century. You're both wearing AirPods. Um, we've been hosting so many of our social engagements over Zoom because of COVID. Like, what, why are people okay to accept? And then actually in Jack's book, Home Economics, he says that, I think it's like, Jack, you can correct me here, 80% of people look at their phone either within 10 minutes before they go to sleep or 10 minutes after they wake up. Why are, are humans happy to live so happily or frankly unhappily alongside technology and yet feel, I mean, feel the feelings of Prince Charles. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's, yeah. I think a big part is that our, we think of our home as being something that is solid, that is um, more tangible than, let's say, the questions around privacy and our iPhones. And, you know, like we have a different kind of relationship to our home or to our space and to the built environment than we do to other forms of technology that intersect with it, that are more intangible. Um, to the average person that we don't see it, we don't touch it, we don't walk on it. And I think that it has a major impact for how people then really think about the relationship to automation. Um, and also it's invisible. Like the pr production of housing is vastly invisible to the vast majority of people. It's vastly inaccessible um, because it is so complex and so complicated. So there's also that layer there too, is that it's very unknown. And so uh, automation coming into that conversation can be really overwhelming when you start thinking about, okay, well, what, where then can I begin to interact with it? Sorry, Jack, you had your finger up. No, could I also answer that question? Yeah, yeah please. Um, <laughs> I, have, I have a slightly different approach to it, uh, which is that, um, I mean, basically, in the 19th and 20th century, all uh, new technical innovations and changes in forms of labor actually created higher paying jobs. So if you used to work in Nantucket making whale candles, then actually getting a job making light bulbs was a step up. You were paid better for more or less the same work. And so for the last two centuries, innovate, technological innovation has brought higher paying, higher skilled jobs. And the belief in the 1960s was that this would go on forever until eventually you work for 30 or 40 minutes a day and you're incredibly well paid and you spend most of your life doing leisure. And that was the trajectory of capitalism. That's what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be wrapped up with democracy and eventually we would not work very much and be very well paid. Um, that, that didn't happen because of a kind of a counter capitalist counter revolution in the 1970s, um, which now we would we call kind of neoliberalism but has a number of different names and in the uk um this has a really important uh, relationship with the home because um and i'll use the comparison with brexit uh i'm deeply opposed to brexit it wasn't my idea and uh one of the reasons why i spent so many years living in paris was to escape the brits um uh, but uh and, none, and to kind of live out my fantasy of being an actual european of which i am no longer um, 
However, if you go back to say 2012 and you look at statistics on whether or not you want to leave the EU, about 5% of people want to think it's an important issue. So it's not even in the top 20. Now, Britain is structured into 48-52 divide. And this was the same for home ownership. If you go back to 1900 across all of Europe and America, and you say, do you want to own your own home? It's about 3% of the population want to do that. And that's because the private systems of ownership and land and rental made it almost impossible for anyone who wasn't an aristocrat or an or a, a, a oil baron to get a mortgage. Um, so it just wasn't an aspiration. And in the 1950s and 60s in America, and then in the 70s and 80s in Britain, uh, when Margaret Thatcher asked people if they wanted to own their own home, she created the desire and the need for it. So our entire relationship with it as a finance, because it's ultimately what Molly's saying is it's a financial product. And I think the mistake that people are making when they get threatened by technology in the building sector is it's like, it's going to take my job, I'm going to lose uh, income, right? But actually, the problems with the housing sector are not technological. They're not a te it's not a technical question. It's a political and economic question, which is when you have a government which is dedicated to, and it, it's not, uh, this isn't a, a political uh, polarization question because it cuts across the left and the right. And it's a bipartisan problem. When you have a government which basically says, get a mortgage, um, which means that you have to have a stable, well-paying job. I mean, it's a disaster for people in the gig economy there. Um, then you will be able to pay off this mortgage and the home will become an asset which will pay for your retirement and it will go up in value all the time. The immediate question is how do you make sure that the house always goes up in value? This has been a major problem for Western governments. And so um, housing shortages are structurally built into our political systems. We cannot, if we, if we made an unlimited supply of high quality affordable housing, it would tank the property markets, which would tank our economies in general, because our economies are built on private ownership. So it is not possible. This is why one of the things that I would say most fervently is you cannot solve the housing crisis. It's not a, a possible to, to do that it, unless you end capitalist property relations, which um, you know, I want to do, but um, it doesn't, it's, it's a bit of a niche position. At the yeah, no, I, I want to ask you actually exactly on this point, because you mentioned um, the counter revolution. And in your uh, writing, you talk about the counter, it, this is this is an introduction to your book, Real Estate's Life Without Debt. So this was uh, about eight years ago now. Um, uh, and so you write, you quote uh, an article from the LRB, um, at the start of the book, and, mm. and the author writes, um, what we're waiting for is the counter-counter-revolution led by progressives who have learned the lesson, lessons from the age of neoliberalism and are unafraid to make use of its instruments in order to overthrow them. And this is the question I had for you, Jack, because mm. you've mentioned a lot in your writing about capitalism, neoliberalism. Now, I mean, we're talking about um, economy and, of course, political structures inextricably linked. Mm. Um, it seems to me and we see this, you know, in all disciplines for, for any revolutionary or anybody who wants to kind of overthrow the system. How does one mm. make use of the instruments, which are things themselves of the system without being subsumed by them? And how do you negotiate this tension in your work? Yeah, two things very quickly. First thing is when I wrote that, I was still as angry as I am now, uh, but I was younger and obviously far more idealistic um, and less knowledgeable, actually. But but the point is, the biggest shift personally that uh, I've undergone in the last 10 years is not that I've let my values um, uh, 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 you know, weaken in any way, but that the entire history of the logic of revolution needs to be rethought. Basically, I really am not a big believer in violence, and therefore I don't think that any of the solutions to the problems we're describing come about through violent revolution. Um, or rather, maybe the question is, how long can a revolution be? I mean, I would argue that neoliberalism is a 50 year unfolding revolution. It doesn't just happen overnight. It's not a, you know, you seize the, the uh, central television and uh, a station and you seize the palace and, and the coup's done. It's, it's a, it can be an unfolding thing. And in architecture, revolutions take centuries to achieve. Um, but generally, my attitude has been one of less uh, transformative change and more thinking about restorative justice. 
And I, I think the, uh, the phrase climate justice, which was coined by um, Mary Robinson, the, the uh, ex-president of Ireland and one of the key figures in the Paris Accords um, uh, of uh, 2015, um, this idea of joining a sense of justice to climate is, I think, a really important one. And at least the concept which I think best describes this idea of repair or restoration rather than total transformation um, is the Jewish concept of tikkun olum, which means uh, kind of literally repairing the world. It's You don't need to go out and radically transform the world. You need to go and look for what is broken and restore it. Um, so that's been a kind of conceptual change for me. But in practical terms, I just give it very briefly, which is, um, the housing company that I am, have started and I'm in the process of currently funding, which is insanely stressful and really difficult, is based, it's the world's first ethical housing company, which begins from the point like, well, why isn't there any other ethical housing? What does that mean? The ethical capital sector um, is worth $30 trillion. It's growing at 60% per year because millennials don't want to put money into Saudi oil or Xinjiang slave labor. And uh, so they're looking for like green social impact companies to invest in. Only 5% of that money goes into real estate because developers do not produce an ethically recognizable product. They're not interested in environmental impact. They're not interested in social impact. They're not in interested in transparent governance. So we've designed a building product and building model backwards from what it means to uh, apply for ethical impact capital. Mm. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I could go into details about exactly what that means, but in essence, it means creating the highest performing mass producible and scalable uh, high density housing product in the world. It means looking at alternative models of ownership, which move away from individual ownership and look at collective and fractional ownership. So to, to do things like remove the barrier of, of ownership where you have to have a deposit for mortgage to remove the obligation of long-term debt um, and, and, and so on. And also mm -hmm. to create collective relationships with buildings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the problems you have in high-rise urban structures, which are increasingly the model that humans live in, is if there's a leak on the top floor, everyone who lives on the top floor is really worried about it. And everyone on the ground floor doesn't really care because it's not mm. their problem. Mm. That's Whereas if you own a percentage of the whole building, any problem is everyone's problem. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, and from a governance standpoint, it's about creating transparency and accountability and systems of, of governance which are inclusive and pluralist. Mm. Um, so that's that's basically what Real, Real Homes is. And it's, and in terms of specifically answering your question, I'm using all of the benchmarks and all of the existing corporate categories, such as B Corp as a standard of corporate governance, Passive House as a standard of environmental performance, and so on and so forth, in order that when you present your product, it, it can be de-risked by the market and people who are looking to invest in it can understand it in, in comparison with other products. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's basically, yeah, that's how you get access to a $30 trillion untapped sector for anyone who's <laughs> thinking of going into housing development. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, um, Jack. And I want to, this will be the last question from me because we've had some, some great questions in the chat. But Molly, similarly, and you mentioned your experience in the run up to COP26 this year, you presented your work. Um, and, and, you know, it's always a challenge for environmental activists whether or not to engage with these enormous kind of annual conferences of parties. Yeah. And I think we all watched kind of a vlog from, uh, certainly from France, maybe Jack, I don't know if you went up. Um, I did not. Yeah, I, it, was, it, was, it was such a kind of, I think, you know, moment uh, of last year. And did you have the feeling um, kind of to Jack's point about being within the system, but kind of like signifying, you know, you know um, on the system, did you, have, did you have the feeling that there was real radical change happening or was it essentially a big festival of empty, um, public relations? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I would say probably the latter is uh, more appropriate to describe it, but I think what's interesting, what's, what, I, what we've been observing and seeing happen in the UK is a huge amount of investment in green technology. For whatever reason that, that is behind that, we can probably assume that it is um, not the most ethical, right? 
there's a lot of greenwashing happening of, of new technologies. And I think um, some of the events that we were involved with could border on, on that. Now, what's interesting, however, is that when you look at some of the questions that are being asked around new technologies, particularly when it comes to housing production and manufacturing, um, uh, that the major funders in the UK are um, putting out there. So we have the EPSRC, which is Engineering and Physical Sciences Council, Research Council, um, and we have Innovate UK. Um, and in some of the calls that are being put out around how we can begin to address some of these issues around the climate crisis um, and housing crisis, et cetera, which are really one in the same, right? The housing crisis and climate crisis can't be, can't be extricated from each other. Um, is how do we deal with these issues using technologies and innovative technologies in socially meaningful ways. So we're seeing now then some of the ways that um, new technology is being funded or innovation is being funded is that these questions are being put central to the, the, the funding calls. And that's the very first time that we've seen that, particularly with the EPSRC. And so that's a really interesting moment where you're actually seeing a concern around social value and around how to engage people and how to do it in, let's say, quote unquote, an ethical way, depending on if you really believe that that's possible or not, um, for the very first time. So I think that there's a, a sea shift that's happening in how um, the funding bodies are beginning to think that we can't just, again, as Jack said, which is an argument that I've put out before, is like technology is not the answer. It's not the only, it's not the, it's also not the, pro, it's not the only problem, right? So how do we begin to really be, again, really embed these social questions back into how, to, how we address technology? So one of the ways that I like to think about this is um, um, I'm really not into robots that are like single task robots, like a brick laying robot or a tile laying robot or robots that just do one thing. I'm really interested in, again, the really simple and dumb robot that can do many different things and can be many different things. And that allows us to really say, okay, techn the technology is just a tool, just like any other tool that we've had. And therefore it's the way that we frame the use of that tool that imbues it with meaning. And so I think now we're really beginning to see that understanding come through, but it's a really long, it's going to take a long time and because it's going to take a long time, because we have, again, this massive gap automation, what, we, what I like to refer to as the automation gap um, in how we build and how other industries do it, we're, we need to find new ways of having that conversation happen. And thankfully, the EPSRC and other funding bodies are beginning to have that, but they also don't know how to have that conversation. So they have to be shown how to have that conversation. And that's where I think projects like what we're doing and what Jack's or Jack is doing is really important because we can begin to you know, ask the right kind of questions in those conversations. Is the same thing happening in America, Molly? This will be my last question. Um, America is a, a different beast because it's so it's so vast. Like we don't, yeah. you know, in the in in the U.S., you have every state has a different way of uh, um, a different kind of planning board, a different architects board. You have to be registered in state per state, so it's it's really difficult there. Um, some states are doing things better than others, but you're also seeing some states fail more quickly at doing what they thought was an innovative way of delivering um, new housing in, in, than others. So for example, California, it was the home of Katera, which is a massive failure um, in house building in the US, which is also one of the, the first um, unicorn in construction tech in 2019. It was backed by SoftBank. Um, a Japanese um, venture capital. Um, so, you know, we're seeing some states that are trying that have this kind of open, are opening up some of those questions, but they've also always been homes of innovation. So, you know, California, obviously Silicon Valley, also in the 1940s and 50s with um, the case city homes, there's a culture of that that already exists around housing and technology. So it's very difficult to say, it really depends on where you are. The UK, because it's much more centralized, um, because we have, we're a much smaller country, you know, we see, we can see, I think that a bit more transparently. Mm -hmm. But at its best, let's say, take the best example of the best state, uh, we would still, you would still argue that England is, is kind of ahead of, ahead of it. 
Um, I think that there is, uh, no, I wouldn't argue that England is necessarily ahead. I think that the questions that are being asked are slightly different. Sure. I think the, I think that we have different, it's a different context. It has different problems. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have to think differently depending on, depending on where we are. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it, yeah, I, and I think we, you can't really say as a result. Um, mm -hmm. California in particular is one of the more interesting ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, I mean, you would think that New York would be very, a, a place where you see a lot of innovation. There's absolutely zero. So, mm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let's. I want to get to these questions in the chat. <coughs> I first want to acknowledge uh, the international uh, makeup of tonight's audience. Something I really like about doing these Zoom calls as opposed to in-person events. Although I do like hello to some of the people who are on Zoom tonight who I see in person. Thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> So we have people from California, the French Alps, London, Paris, Montreal, and Paris, among others. Um, so that's that's really exciting. So hello to everyone. Um, a question from Stephen, and maybe this can go to you, Jack. Um, looking to the, oh, and indeed Molly, if you want to add things after. Looking to the future and sustainability, how do we shift attitudes, uh, NIMBY not in my backyard, and policies zoning away from single family homes and build more multi, family, multi-generational housing, and in some cases, mixed use, uh, which is say retail on the ground level, residential above with shared and public spaces. Um, in a way, thank you for the question. In a way, it, it almost answers itself, mm -hmm. which is there's a, um, there, there's, a, there's a common, there's a recurring motif to my answers tonight, which is it's an economic question mainly. Um, and the the phrase that it turns out I didn't invent it. I found out a number of years later that uh, an, another American author had used it 25 years before me in a completely different context. But the term that I use for this is form follows finance, uh, which I'm now continuing to say that I coined. Uh, <laughs> this an anachronism is unfortunate. But basically, I really believe that all building forms, I mean, all buildings are just precipitations of contracts and financial structures which generate them um, at any point in history. Uh, so the question here is an economic one, and I would refer to the 20th century philosopher uh, John Rawls, uh, who put forward an incentives argument, in, which is the core of neoliberalism, actually, which says that nobody does anything unless you incentivize them. And that's how we end up paying bankers huge bonuses, because the argument is, Bankers do not want to be bankers, they hate doing it. So we have to pay very high uh, salaries in order to attract the right type of people to do this very unattractive job. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever met bankers or you work in the financial sector, I've never met an industry which loves more what it does. Um, however, the point is, you, you know, it's a question for me at the beginning. And I think also there's, there's an overlap. I'm, I don't speak for Molly, but I think there's an overlap in our practice here, which is, a question of how you look at stakeholders and how you look at incentives and yeah. who is incentivized by what. Um, and at least for me, I'm always thinking, you know, what is the incentive for the developer? What, how are they going to make a profit? What's the nature of that profit? You know, is it a, a cash lump sum at the conclusion of the building? Is it an ongoing revenue? What's the difference in those business models? How does it affect the quality of the building? Um, what's the incentive of the people who live there? What do they, what do they really want? What's the incentive of the city? authorities, what's the incentive of the other citizens in the neighborhood and so on. Um, because I think the more that you can, you can, in a way, throw a design project which intersects in that Venn diagram of all of the key incentives, uh, the closer you get. And of course, that, you know, the, the better the work is. But in a, in a sense, that's also a constantly shifting target, because um, I think sometimes what happens is people misidentify incentives or they, they create a kind of cookie cutter rule or template, which then gets applied incorrectly to, to a context. So it's not always the case that we need to densify. Um, it may also be the case that actually we need to densify some parts of the city by 20 times while leaving or de-densifying other parts of the city. So demolishing every second building, for example, that may be in line with other types of incentives which come along with um, you know, wildlife corridors or biodiversity objectives or even rainfall catchment and preventing flooding. So there are many other types of um, considerations which uh, might lead to, you know, how we look at those incentives and therefore the types of yeah. solutions that we adapt. I realize a bit of a wishy-washy answer. Hopefully mm -hmm. that was... No, it was great. Molly, would you like to add 
anything to, to the question? Yeah, I mean, I was I would agree with Jack and in that incentivization is everything. And I think one of the things that um, we've found really important is um, also like unlocking people's imagination. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, a, that's something that we, we don't do enough and is very difficult to do given the time in which we live. Um, but by unlocking people's imagination, you're able to demonstrate, I think, that we have much more intersectionality between our visions of the future than, than um, you'd expect. Mm -hmm. And that can really bring people together to mm -hmm. understand that um, we, in order to survive, you know, like to be as like moon shoot thinking as possible to, in order to survive, we need to be able to begin to think differently about our built environment. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to work together and be collaborative and cooperative with one another and think of new models for social interaction mm -hmm. and politics and economics than ever before. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really time sensitive. It's a time sensitive conversation and it's a time sensitive call to action. And I think that, that that for us is really important, is beginning to find ways to, to really enable people to unlock their imaginations mm. in new and powerful ways. Mm. Mm. I think it's such a great point and it gets to, and I kind of, I suppose, um, the, the underlying um, thought that I was having when I was asking you about if you felt that America was, was acting on this is because the field that I'm really interested in, um, the environmental humanities, which is precisely to your point Molly that there is a role for the humanities you know English philosophy history yeah. sociology anthropology there is a role for for these people <laughs> um in the climate crisis and and that's yeah. really like fomenting mostly in California but also yeah. on the east coast um and so and and that they or they when you when you listen to them or kind of read um, their books, many of which are behind me, they talk about the role of the imagination. It's also why we're seeing a kind of uptick and, and real interest in science fiction, as I'm sure yep. both of you know. Um, so, so it's really interesting. Okay, we have a, yeah, go ahead, please. Oh no, maybe I just add to that because in a way when you were speaking, I almost couldn't imagine any other sphere of practice which or discipline which would be relevant to the climate crisis mm. because mm. Uh, anyone who spends much time with climate catastrophe and mass extinction becomes instantly extremely depressed and uh, suffers climate grief. Mm. Um, and so mainly our attitude towards it is a cultural and emotional uh, problem. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. But what I find very beautiful, I just finished a great book, which I recommend to you all um, called The Dawn of Everything by David Bengro and David Graeber. And it's a uh, study of 200,000 years of human um, archeology span and sociology. And basically it says the narrative that humans were not very interesting until about 15,000 years ago when suddenly we invented agriculture and then got cities and priest classes and kings and modern economies. Uh, you know, what were we doing for those other like 185,000 years? And what they show is that, um, you know, that humans are really weird and eccentric people. And we come up with crazy ideas about the structure of reality and our place in it and have done for, um, such a long time that when the Aboriginal Australians, the oldest continuous civilization, appear 60,000 years ago, you're like, who are these upstart modernists? Mm -hmm. um, but what's beautiful about that book is it, it will chart uh, the incredible rise and fall of a Mesopotamian city over 800 years in which, you know, a dictator emerges and everyone decides that they're not going to live with this and they're going to go to another city. So the city mm -hmm. becomes abandoned. And when I look at the current climate crisis, I, this, I, I'm actually way more inspired by studies of archaeology, sociology, anthropology, and mm. philosophy than I am by science fiction. Mm. Because if you want to know how incredibly varied and exotic and amazing the future will be, mm. you only need to look even to your grandparents' generation. Yeah. Uh, 